Good evening. I'm Jerry Woolley. I'm filling in tonight for our pastor, Bruce Chesser. He has been serving as president of our Tennessee Baptist Convention. Uh, our church is here in the Tennessee, uh, great state of Tennessee, and uh, they, uh, the annual convention is taking place this week, and so that is where he is at the moment. It ends later today, and his term will end as president, and a, a new person will assume that role. He has done a phenomenal job. We are so proud to have him uh, not only as our pastor, but as our leader throughout the state. He has done a great job. He has asked me if I could fill in for him today since he could not be here. And, uh, you know, I'm going to pick up with where my connect group kind of left off this past Sunday. We were studying out of Colossians. We were studying out of Colossians 3. And towards the end of our passage, we were looking at verse 16 that told us that we are to uh, let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you teaching and admonishing one another, uh, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom and singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts for God. In our class, we had a little bit of discussion about psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Uh, why are we instructed to sing those? You know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting that Paul would take time in this letter to the church of Colossae to specifically tell them in addition to teaching and in addition to their conversations make sure they were spending time together singing and he specifically talk, talked about psalms well we know that there's psalms in the old testament our pastor is leading us through the study of the book of psalms on wednesday nights we know about those um, there's 150 psalms what are the other songs and spiritual songs uh, that uh, or hymns and spiritual songs that Paul might be referring to. Well, if you look throughout Scripture, you find that actually in many ways our Bible is a hymn book. Uh, not only are there 150 psalms in the book of Psalms, but there's at least another uh, 45 to 50 songs, hymns, psalms, that are scattered throughout both the Old and the New Testament. In fact, a couple of weeks ago as we were reading or as we were studying in our connect group in Colossians, one of the passages we looked at, at least one uh, Bible scholar believes that that possibly might have been a song that at least the church at Colossae would sing when they got together. Or maybe, maybe all the, the believers at that point in time, Christians all across um, the, the known Christian world at that point in time may have used that as a song. We're not certain. So there may be a lot more than 50 extra songs in scripture in addition to those psalms but we'll just round it off and say somewhere in the nature of about 200 songs that are there and why do you think we were instructed to sing songs hymns spiritual songs what what is the purpose of singing that I mean not just to hear how good a voice somebody might have or how bad a voice somebody might have what is what is the real purpose that Paul would say that well one of those reasons is that you know, songs are our, they are a record of our collective story. Even in pop music and secular music, if I were to ask you uh, what are some of your favorite songs, chances are good that those songs would be from the era that you were an older teenager, young adult. It's our era of history, and those songs tell the collective story of that time. Uh, and it, that is held true from the beginning. Uh, that songs are, are part of our collective story. The same thing with our faith songs. They are a story of, while they may have been written by one person as a personal testimony, they become our collective testimony, our collective story of faith. Another reason we're instructed to uh, sing songs and sing hymns and psalms is that they teach us our doctrine. They teach us about our faith. They teach us what we believe. So often when we are singing a hymn, we are singing scripture. It has been written right out of scripture and it's teaching us not only God's word, but it's teaching us doctrine that is so important to us. And then the third and maybe the most uh, important reason, actually it is the most important reason, is that when Paul said, make sure that you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, it's because those psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs point to the mighty, powerful God that we serve. 
They are songs that acknowledge his greatness. They are songs that exalt him and honor him. They are songs of praise. And we are instructed to make sure that we are singing songs of praise. You know, singing is built into us from uh, birth. So often you see a young child not able to speak yet, not able to to talk or do much of anything, but when they start to hear music, their heads turn towards it. They start moving towards that music. God built music into us for a very important reason. He knows that for most of us, we learn through music. Whether we realize it or not, we learn so much through music. We are people of song starting with Jesus loves me all the way up to now. We are a people of song. So the first recorded song in the Bible is in Exodus 15. And we're going to look at that passage today. I wanted to stay within the keeping of the pastor's study of the book of Psalms, but uh, instead of using one of the Psalms that he will be teaching uh, so expertly here in the next few weeks, we're gonna look at a different song. And uh, it happens to be the very first song that is recorded in scripture, and it's Exodus 15. While you're finding that in your Bibles, just to bring you up to date, kind of set the stage for what is taking place, uh, if we look at the 13th and 14th chapters of Exodus, we know that is where uh, Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They are starting their journey towards the promised land. It is interesting that Scripture says that God said, don't take them the straight and quickest route. And the reason he said that is because he knew that they would meet the Philistines and it would create a battle that would discourage the Israelites too soon. They would be discouraged and want to turn back. And so God actually told Moses to take them on a route that caused them to wander through through the desert, wander through the wilderness, Uh, even to the point that God said, when Pharaoh sees the way you're kind of going back and forth, he'll think you're confused. And that was for God's purpose, that the children of Israel looked like they were confused. But the story tells us of them wandering through the wilderness. God is directing their path using a cloud or a pillar of clouds by day, a pillar of fire at night. And as long as they keep their eyes on the cloud, as long as they keep their eyes on this burning fire that's leading them at night, they are going the way God wants them to. But all of a sudden, that cloud brings them to the edge of the Red Sea. There was no bridges. There were no pontoon boats sitting there waiting for them. There were possibly several million people standing on the banks of the Red Sea wondering how in the world are we gonna get across? How are we gonna get to the other side? And then all of a sudden someone looks behind them and they see this great cloud of dust and they start wondering what is causing all that dust and they look closely and they realize that it is Pharaoh and his entire army, all of his chariots, they are racing after them. I think it's very interesting in the 13th chapter, or in the 14th chapter, verse 13, uh, Moses said to the people, don't be afraid, stand firm and see that the Lord's salvation is with you. He will provide for you today for the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. I love that phrase. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again if you just stand firm. But at that moment, while they had left Egypt and triumphed, they had just turned into jellyfish there on the edge of this sea. They, had, they were terrified. They were in chaos. If you watch the Charlton Heston version of the Ten Commandments, they were milling around, they were screaming, they were crying out to God to save them. What in the world are we gonna do? The sea is in front of them, the Egyptian army is behind them, and they are crying out to God. And God basically says, you need to be quiet. You just need to be still, you need to be quiet. He told Moses, he said, tell them to break camp and get ready to move, but do so with with a peaceful attitude, do so quietly. They begin to break camp. All of a sudden that pillar of, of cloud and that pillar of fire that has been leading them, it moves around and it gets behind them and it divides or creates a separation between the tribe of Israel and the army of the Egyptians. It creates a blockage where the army cannot see through, they cannot get through. And while that is happening, God instructs Moses, stretch out your hand in front of the sea. And when he does, what happens? 
That sea just opens up beautifully. Scripture actually says a wind blew all night long and dried out the path so that when these possibly millions, possibly two million um, Israelites began to walk across, they weren't walking across mud. They weren't walking in ankle deep water. Scripture tells us they were walking across dry land. They were going across dry land. What moments before had been a sea that they couldn't cross, they are now walking right through the middle of it on dry land. Can you just imagine, put yourself for a moment in their shoes, what must it have felt like? For one thing, you still know the Egyptian army's behind you and, and you're struggling to have faith that God is really gonna rescue you from that, and so you're nervous from that. And at the same time, you just have these huge walls of water on each side of you and you are probably wondering at what second the water is going to cave in on top of you and you're just going to be swept up into the sea as a whole and drown. And they're going across and they get to the other side and all of a sudden God instructs Moses once again, stretch out your arm, stretch out your staff. And when he does, at this point, the water fills back in that gap. But there was someone in the gap, the Egyptian army. All of Pharaoh's chariots and Egyptian army was in the middle of the sea. They were on dry land for a moment. They were the ones who experienced that wall of water, or those walls of water coming in and literally just overtaking them. And it said that they sunk to the bottom like lead. And they were all drowned from that. 24 hours ago, you had a group of people on one side of the Red Sea and they were in fear and confusion. And 24 hours later, they're on the other side of the Red Sea without any of them even getting their feet wet. And they are praising and singing songs of gratitude. So I'm gonna start uh, actually with the last verse of chapter 14. And then we're gonna look at the first 18 verses of chapter 15. Chapter 14, verse 31. When Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant Moses. You know, God has already rescued them from plagues. He's already done so much. And yet they have struggled to believe that he's really God, that he's really powerful. And it says, but at this moment, when they are safely on the other side of the sea, they all collectively feared the Lord, believed in him, and believed in the leadership of Moses. Now chapter 15. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. They said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. He threw Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. The elite of his officers were drowned in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They sank in the depths like a stone. Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. You overthrew your adversaries by your great majesty. You unleashed, you unleashed your burning wrath. It consumed them like stubble. The waters heaped up at the blast of your nostrils. The current stood firm like a dam. The watery depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire will be gratified at their expense. I will draw my sword, my hand will destroy them. But you, you blew your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you glorious in holiness, revered with praises, performing wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You will lead the people. You have redeemed with your faithful love. You will guide them in your holy dwelling, guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. When the peoples hear, they will shudder. Anguish will seize the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be ter terrified. Trembling will seize the leaders of Moab. The inhabitants of Canaan will panic. The terror and dread will fall on them. They will be as still as a stone because of your powerful arm until your people pass by, Lord, until the people whom you purchase pass by. 
You will bring them in and plant them. On the mountain of your possession, Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. The Lord will reign forever and ever. You know, this passage, uh, this uh, 15th chapter, this song, it is truly a song of victory. Not just random victory, but very specific victory against the Egyptian army that was drowned in the sea. That, that's pointed out so well in this passage. But it's also a song about Yahweh and his mighty deeds. It's not just telling a story of what Yahweh did, but it is telling who Yahweh is, who the Lord is his strength and his powerful right arm, how it has protected them and how it has guided them. It is also a song that not only recounts the past, but it's a song that tells of the future. It points to the future of what God is going to do. They were grateful of what God had done, but they were also grateful of what they believed and trusted that God would do in the future. You know, it's a generational song of worship, pure and simple worship is what this song is. We can almost picture Moses and all the Israelites standing on the banks of the Red Sea, looking back over this sea, sea that is now just at its normal uh, depth. And most likely, this is gruesome, but the reality would be there would be the Egyptian bodies would probably be floating along, horses, chariots, all kinds of wreckage and carnage that is a result of that. They're looking back over it, but their hearts are filled with gratitude. You know, Paul told us in Colossians, when you sing, sing with hearts of gratitude. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart. And they were singing that. Scripture actually tells us that Moses led the Israelites, and then it goes on in, a, in the later part of chapter 15 and says, and Miriam, Moses' sister, led the women. We think it may have been an uh, uh, antiphonal song, a song where one part leads and the other part echoes back and forth. That just went back and forth as, as we almost get the impression that Moses is making the statement, everybody else follows and repeats it, sings it along with him. Let's break down the passage just a little bit and look for some points in here. The first three verses, I'm going to say, are a call to praise. You know, for a hymn to be a hymn, typically it will start with a call to praise. What is our purpose of singing this song? Well, their purpose was, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing because he is highly exalted. But I want you to notice in these first three verses, specifically verses, uh, verse 2, that this God of their fathers, the God of the patriarchs, has now become a very personal God. It's become each of their individual God. So in verse 2, it says, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. He's my father's God, and I will exalt him for that. But I'm praising him because he is my God. You know, it's so necessary for God to be our personal God. When we come to Jesus Christ for, and we accept his, we accept salvation through, through his blood, we can't be saved because of our father's salvation, because of our mother's salvation, because of anyone else's salvation. It has to be a personal, a personal confession of sin, a personal uh, recognition of, of who we are without Christ and our need for Christ. It has to be a, a personal acceptance of his forgiveness. Here, the Israelites realized they needed a personal God, not just the God they had heard about, but all of a sudden as they look back over that sea and realize they had walked through on dry ground, it had become a very personal, personal God to them. So it's a call to praise. It ends in verse 3, the Lord is a warrior, Yahweh is his name. If uh, you see, if your uh, translation has a little black dot there, the pastor teaches us to go to the back and see what the black dot says, and is, in this case, Yahweh is the personal name of God in Hebrew. It was their very personal God. Not just the God of history, not just the God of their fathers, but their personal God. The next set of verses, verses 4 through 10, I'm going to title those reasons to praise. When we sing a hymn, it starts with a call to praise, but then we move into a point where we are listing our reasons. Why is it that we are praising God? What, what, is, what brought us to this point of praising God? 
And in these verses, 4 through 10, we have a recounting of what has happened in chapter 13 and 14 of Exodus. We have a recounting of Pharaoh's chariots and his army, and it says, you threw them into the sea. You know, Scripture tells us that uh, Pharaoh had 600 of his best chariots and then all the others. Isn't that interesting? 600 of the best and then all the others. We don't know how many that is. There is one estimation that I found that there could have been as many as 20,000 chariots. That sounds like a lot of chariots, but there, there's some other uh, extra biblical evidence out there that the Egyptian army, when it would go up against uh, an enemy, would often have a force of 30,000 or more. So when you look at that, it's not unrealistic to think that there may have been 20,000 chariots that all of a sudden were consumed by the sea. And it says that he threw Pharaoh's chariots and his armies into the sea, the elite of his officers, the very best. Pharaoh took the best of the best with him. They were all drowned in the Red Sea. Another little black dot, Red Sea. And if you go and look that up, it says Sea of Reeds. In some translations, instead of Red Sea, it may re- your translation may read the Reed or the Sea of Reeds. Um, that were there on the shoreline. And so it says they were drowned in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They sank like stones. Look on down though in verse seven. It says, you overthrew your adversaries. The point we need to pull out of that is the battle was very personal to God. It wasn't just Israel's battle with Egypt. It was God's battle with his adversaries. The battle is personal to him. The battle belongs to him. The battle's going to be fought by him. You know, whatever you may be going through today and you're wondering who is on your side, who is going to fight your battle, whether it's a battle of illness or or other things that may be taking place and you're thinking, I'm in the midst of this battle. I need someone to fight with me. And God is waiting for us just to say, God, this is your battle, not mine. The Israelites thought they were the ones that were going to have to battle against Egypt. You know, it's interesting if you go back and look at the 13th, 14th chapter, it says that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they left in battle formation. Moses actually structured them and put them in battle formation as they walked out of Egypt onto uh, their journey to the promised land. They were in battle formation. I had never really paid attention to that and noticed that before. They were ready for battle. But when the battle came, when the time for battle came, they were so afraid. They were so, uh, uh, they were in such chaos. They, they didn't, they probably lost the formation, the battle formation at that point. They didn't know how to fight the battle. And God was just waiting for them to cry out and say, you know, Lord, it's your battle. You're going to have to fight on our behalf, rescue us. And it says here in this song there in verse 7 that very definitely the Lord, God, Yahweh overthrew his adversaries with his great majesty. Interesting in there, it, it talks about that they were consumed like stubble. Why would Moses and the children of Israel even use the term stubble well it's a it's a throwback to what they had been doing for decades what had they been doing making brick out of stubble they knew what stubble was they knew what it was like for somebody to come along and cut or harvest the wheat the good stuff and leave the leave the stubble and then they had to go in and and try to take that and turn that into bricks and they're saying you turn the Egyptian army back into the very thing that we have spent decades as slaves trying to work with and trying to create something out of. It shows God is in control. And the next verse, verse eight says that you heaped, uh, the water's heaped up at the blast of your nostrils. Isn't it amazing? We serve a God that with the simple action of taking in a breath and (sighs) expelling a breath, he can change the course of history with just a breath. The next time you're in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a storm, in the middle of anxiety, and you take in that deep breath, stop, hold it for a second and realize that with just such a breath, God can change the course of history. God can show his power. God can, can literally defeat the most powerful army on the face of the earth at that point in time with a breath. So we see, first of all, the call to praise, and then we see verses 4 through 10 that is our reason, it's our list 
of praise. Going down to verses 11 through 13. And I've titled this, uh, this is our statement of trust. Typically when we look at a hymn, it starts out with a call for others to come and join us in praise. It lists our reasons of why we are praising. And then it ends with a statement of because of what you have done in the past, I can trust you in the future. It's a statement of trust. And in here, they ask the question, Lord, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, revered with praise, performing wonders? You know, when God defeated the Egyptian army, he also de defeated their gods, their deities. There is one estimation that they may have had as many as 2,000 different gods, 2,000 different deities that they worshiped. And this song is saying, there's none of them as powerful as you. There's none of them that is mighty as you. You alone are revered and praised. You alone can perform great wonders. It is an acknowledgement that when God defeated the army, he defeated the God of that army as well. It says, you stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You will lead the people you have redeemed with your faithful love, you will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. It's an acknowledgement that he has already prepared a place for them. He will get them there. It is his strength that will get them there. I want you to notice that right here, starting in um, verse 13, but really more so in 14, the, it goes from past to future. Now, some of your translations may have these verses as if they are in the past as well. And the problem of that is that, or the challenge is that in interpreting and in translating, you have to deal with these things called past tense, future tense, perfect tense, all these things that our English teachers tried to teach us that we didn't pay much attention to. And so when we start looking at the tense that was used in this, some translators translate it as if it is going to happen. Other translators translate it as if it has already happened. It doesn't matter to the story. What matters to the story is it is a declaration of God's power that God not only overthrew the Egyptians, but look what's going to happen. The peoples of the earth are going to shudder. As they hear the story of what God did to the Egyptian army, they themselves will shudder. They will be in anguish. The inhabitants of Philistia, you know, that God didn't want them to go direct to uh, battle with Philistines because he knew they would be discouraged and want to turn back. But now all of a sudden, because of what God did to Egypt's army, the, the army of the Philistines, Philistia, they will literally uh, be seized with anguish. They will shudder. It goes on and says, the chiefs of Edom will be terrified. Trembling will seize the leaders of Moab. Moab was known as a nation of great strength. And yet, and, and when they hear the story of what God has done, they will tremble and be seized with fear of what might happen to them. The inhabitants of Cana will panic. They will all be in terror. They will all be in dread. They will become like stone. They will be unable to, to do anything. They will just be frozen out of fear. And it, says, it goes on and says, but while they're like a stone, while they're frozen in fear, your powerful arm, your powerful arm will take your people, the people you have purchased. You will lead them and guide them to the very land that, they, that you have already chosen for them, that you have prepared for them. It's showing again that, that the victory of the Egyptian army wasn't just to protect the Israelites. That was a big part of it. But the victory was also to show the world God's power. Not only, you know, there, there was more accomplished in that battle than just the defeat of Egypt. The other more important thing that happened and was accomplished was that the whole world would know of God's mighty power, how powerful he is. It says, you will bring them in and you will plant them on the mountain of your possession. Lord, you have prepared the place for your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. The Lord will reign forever. I... I don't think I said, but I have labeled verses 14 and 16 reasons for praise again. Just like verses um, 4 through 10 were reasons to praise, again we have reasons to praise. Reasons to praise because what God will do in the future. And then these last two verses, 17 and 18, they're the statement of trust. 
because of who you are, because of what you have done, we know that you will reign forever. It is a great statement of trust. So the pastor always asks us, or typically asks us after one of his sermons, what's the so what? What's important about reading this? Good history, fun history, for those of you that are like art that's a history buff, you, you like history, it's good, good story. But what's the so what? What's important about the fact that the Israelites would sing a song on the shores of the Red Sea? Well, just as it is the first recorded hymn or song in scripture, interesting enough, but not coincidentally, the first song mentioned in scripture is also the last song mentioned in scripture. If you go to Revelation 15, you see where the song of Moses, this song that we just read, is referenced again. The first song in scripture is also the last song in scripture. The words are a little different, but the meaning is very much the same. You can, you can see where they are parallel songs, that they were written about the same thing. And what it is telling us is that we have nothing to fear in this age or the age to come, for the Lord will reign forever and ever. The Lord reigned back at the Red Sea. The Lord is still reigning in revelations at the end times. We have nothing to fear of this age or the age to come because the God of the Israelites is the God that we have today. The God with the powerful right arm, the God with the breath that can change the course of history is the same God that we serve today, the same God that, that we um, worship and honor today. And so I'm asking you, what is the so what? Well, the so what is every believer needs a hymn. You need your own hymn. You need your song. You know, there's, I, I pointed out, there's basically three pieces to a song, a call to praise, a list of reasons to praise, and then a statement of trust. You need your own song. Why do you need your own song? I told you this was a generational song. It was a song where one generation shared their story and their faith with the next generation. And it gets passed on and passed on and passed on from Exodus 15 all the way to Revelations 15. It is a story that keeps being told about the great and mighty God. Any of us who has personally experienced the salvation of God, any of us that have personally experienced our own enemy's defeat at the Red Sea should be writing our own song. Now you may say, well, I'm not a poet. You don't have to be. It doesn't have to be a song that you actually sing, but it needs to be the story of your relationship. It needs to be a call of why you worship, why you're going to worship God, and a list of reasons of why you worship. And it needs to be shared. It needs to be shared with your family. It needs to be shared with your friends. A few weeks ago, I officiated at a, a, a going home celebration, a funeral service. And when I met with the family, <clears throat> and we were looking through the, the Bible of the deceased, we found a letter, a letter that she had written 18 years previously. And it was her song. It was her hymn of faith. It became the funeral service. There was nothing else that needed to be said because in that letter, she made her call to worship. Why is it that she worships and why she wanted her children and grandchildren to know why she worshiped the Lord God? And it was her reasons for praise. She was listing all the things about her relationship with Jesus Christ and the things that, that, that God had done for her throughout her life. It was her song of praise. And then in the end, she made her statement of her trust that she would always trust in God for what he had done. She had great faith of what he would do in the future. What is your generational hymn? You know, music is one of those lightning rod issues in churches. And it's usually because one generation doesn't necessarily appreciate the music style of another generation. <clears throat> your, you know, your, your rhythms, your melodies, your choices of instruments might be different, but the song's the same. The song that the Israelites sung in chapter 15 of Exodus is the same song that is sung in Revelation 15. Possibly different instruments, possibly different melodies, but it's the same song.
Our choir last night at the Tennessee Baptist Convention, they concluded with a song that I think is probably the words, if we were to put it in our modern day language, of what the Israelites were trying to say here on the Red Sea. And it was that our God will not be moved. Our God will never change. Our God will reign forevermore. That's the song. That's the song that was sung then. That's the song that'll be sung in Revelation 15. That is the song you and I need to be singing today. What's the so what? We need a song. In the midst of the darkest nights and the roughest storms, we need a song that we can sing the song of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to lead us in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, first of all, that you are our Father. We thank you that as our Father, you are constantly watching out for us. We thank you that when we are in the midst of battles, if we will just look to you and ask you, you will take the battle. It is your battle, and you will fight on our behalf. You will make it a personal battle for yourself, and you will fight. And God, with simply your breath, you can change not only the history of the world, but you can change our history, our future, as you destroy the enemies around us. God, help us to be people that triumphantly walk forward with trust and assurance that the God of the Israelites is the same God that leads us today. The God that protected them against the enemy of the Egyptians is the God that protects us against the enemies that we might be facing today. Thank you for your powerful right hand. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your wisdom and your love. We praise you for that, and we will continue to praise you. We love you. In your son's name we pray, amen.